Hello, good morning to you all. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. Today, I'm Chamberlain. So. Good morning. It's a beautiful Thursday morning. And yeah. um, I think I will have a new friend <laughs> or someone who's going to be advocated for very soon. His mm. name is Mr. Chakachira, the new Auditor General of the Federation. Well, good morning once more and welcome to the program. I'm Maukwe Ogun Yusuf. Oh dear, where's Ayo? Good morning and welcome. My name is Ayo Makinde. Well, of course, you know, our job is to keep government accountable at all times, and that's the whole thing. Today is November 2. It's a Thursday morning, as Marco has said. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayo Makinde, and of course, um, talking about keeping government accountable, we had this conversation, was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? with um, uh, two individuals, and it was two days back, uh, in Imo State concerning the uh, conversations going on back and forth between the Imo State government and the NLC, especially at the national level. That's a little curious because we haven't heard anything from the NLC in Imo State until yesterday. That's the Imo State branch of the NLC or Imo State chapter of the NLC. Until yesterday, well, the news we got is that the president of the NLC, that's Joe Ajero, uh, was arrested in Imo State, in the state capital, and um, he was picked up from the NLC State Council Secretariat by heavily armed policemen in Oweri and taken to an unknown uh, destination. And then we saw that this picture has also been put out. He also said in a video that's already gone viral that he was brutalized, he was beaten and pulverized, you know. And that statement, that corroborates the statement from the NLC uh, themselves in partnership with the TUC that early in the morning, policemen uh, tried to disperse workers who were gathered at the state NLC secretariat without success. And then they came with thugs and uh, they were later, they, they unleashed mayhem on the few workers who had already gathered, uh, smashing car vehicles, um, car windscreens, delivering machete cuts on some, stabbing some. And that's about the same time that they took away the NLC president. And as you can see uh, right there in that video, uh, it's, it's, I, I don't even know what to make of this right now. Well, the, NL, the state, the, the police, beg your pardon, also put out a statement saying, look, he was not arrested. He was only taken into protective custody. Um, I think perhaps the police might also come out to say, uh, you know, what, uh, maybe the NLC will want to corroborate that one way or the other, because this is not good optics in whatever way, manner, shape, or form. The NLC in Imo State also said they don't even know what the NLC at the national level is talking about, that they are okay. I'm wondering exactly what is going on right here. I'm a little, no, I'm not a little confused. I'm extremely confused. And, you know, Mark, well, you, it was something that you also said in our private room that, look, this, this thing is getting really interesting. What is going on? Questions, 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 guys. <sighs> Where do we oh start boy. from now? Because, I mean, it's now, a, it's now a war of narratives. That's essentially what it is. Um, uh, but I, I imagine that if uh, the Imo State... Uh, uh, I don't know if this can be quiet in my ear. Because uh, we can hear the uh, audio of the NLC president, and I don't know whether we're trying to track that up or we're trying to just show the uh, video. Um, but again, Ayo, as you've said, it is questions, questions, questions. So uh, if indeed you have a group of people who are trying to stage a protest, did a, another group of people dressed in police uniforms come there and constitute themselves into a set of thugs? Or the thugs go there um, because, uh, or another crowd of people, because sometimes they say when you want to, I, I don't know how to qualify these people, but I think that by the behavior of a crowd, you'll be able to know whether they are thugs or not. So if the, if the crowd goes there wielding machetes and knives 
and clubs, then they will qualify as thugs. So the, the thugs go there to attack the NLC people who were, who were peacefully assembled uh, trying to stage a protest. Uh, that, that's the question. And were they dressed as police people? Now, if that is the situation, there are very big question marks. Um, and then, I, police says, oh, look, in their own statement that, no, what we noticed was that another group of people had gone there uh, and they were attacking the um, NLC protest. And so we had to remove the NLC president into protective custody. Now, the NLC president says that when he was taken away was when he was brutalized. That's what he says. So a very big question for me will be, is it that the NLC president didn't know when he was attacked? If he was attacked amongst the group of people who were, who were assembled, peacefully assembled in a particular place, getting ready to stage a protest, and you say, oh, they were attacked, and we quickly removed the NLC president uh, for his own safety without dispersing these other people because... You also forget that the other people there were uh, uh, human beings deserving of protection. It raises big questions. Then you remove him into this so-called protective custody, and then it is when he's in the protective custody that he is beaten very badly. Uh, I would think that no matter where it is, no matter how, even if you're blindfolded, you'll be able to tell when you have been taken away from a crowd and whether you're being beaten or not. But there, this is very sinister, and, and it's extremely worrisome. We saw signs of this at the beginning of the week uh, when the NLC um, issued a statement saying that they didn't want to be in any meeting with the Minister of Labor, and, and that they wanted to go on a protest, and they could go on a protest to, um, you know, protest the plight of workers in Imo State. Um, and they've raised concerns about the plight of workers in Imo State. This is coming a few days to elections in Imo State. We know that the NLC in the state is very, very um, disconnected with the national NLC. And so the fact that the NLC in Imo State says, look, we don't have a problem, we are fine, um, you know, raises questions all by itself because everybody knows there is no dispute as to who the national president of the Nigerian Labour Congress is. And you will think that the NLC in Imo State, when they see that the national president of the NLC um, is in such distress, um, one would think that they too will be very upset and that they too will be up in arms and that they too will be curious as to what exactly is going on. But I am particularly worried about the role of the police in all of this. It is one thing for the NLC to have their own internal issues and not be on the same page with regards to how uh, workers have been treated. It is sad, very sad, very worrisome. But it's another thing for police to be involved, um, or allegedly involved, in the brutalization of a National Labour Congress leader. This is unacceptable in any way, shape, manner, or form. So I think that it is time that the police at the national level wades into the matter in, in what is going on in, in Imo State, because this is, this is a, it raises questions. It raises questions about impunity. It raises questions about the use of force. It raises questions about whether people can peacefully assemble in Imo State. Don't forget that elections are coming up, and they have to be held in a very peaceful environment. This is not indicative of an environment that is peaceful or an environment that is tolerant. And, and, and this is not me preempting, of, or preempting anything. I'm just asking questions. I, I, I dare say that I will be scared to go and ask those questions in Imo State at this rate, because if this is what we're seeing of national presidents, of Nigeria Labour Congress. I mean, his eye is swollen. It's, he, he, he looks really, really... He's, in the video which you're seeing and where he's actually talking, he says, oh, I think I must have been made differently because the manner in which I was beaten, um, you know, it is a miracle that I can still speak. 
it is very, very worrisome. And I will say that the Inspector General of Police, who has just been confirmed, needs to know what is happening in Imo State and wade into the matter. If indeed he was taken away for protective custody, according to the police, and it was while he was in the custody of the police that he developed a swollen eye, that needs to be investigated. Kimberly. You know, some of these things, uh, many questions. Um, well, you know, as at the time before that video came through, when the news came through the newsroom that he had been arrested uh, at the time when it wasn't clear what exactly was going on. Of course, as newsmen, you make calls everywhere trying to find out what was going on. And so NRC put up a statement. Uh, and then the statement was titled, the president of the Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, Comrade Joe Ajiro, has been abducted by Hope Zodima and the Imo State Police Commissioner. The first paragraph of that statement says, The government of Imo State has continued to use the instrument of violence and intimidation against the trade unions and their leadership in the state. Just as the Nigerian workers gathered earlier this morning, that was yesterday, led by the leadership of the two labor centers to demonstrate our outrage over the serial and habitual abuse and violation of the rights of workers in the state, the government unleashed blood-cuddling mayhem on the workers. So he spoke about how they were trying to gather. Then the police had tried to disperse them. But then there's this paragraph which says, the police, in the usual manner, accompanied by thugs led by the special assistant to the governor of Imo State on special duties, Mr. China Sawaneri, leading... Others like Tape and Madoka descended on the president of the Congress after overpowering the few workers who were left after the initial battering inflicted heavy injuries and big blows to his head and body and kicking him in the process while dragging him on the ground while the police supervised the mayhem. So it's a pretty long one. And then he says, look, um, he spoke about how they brutalized him, bundled him, and all of those that uh, you guys have highlighted here. So there are several questions. So the police was there? That's the, the statement that they put on here. Uh, so they're saying now that um, they're asking, the, all they've been asking the governor is to honor the agreements signed between them and respect the rights. So that's the statement that the Labour put out before eventually they said the security is released and you heard the president of NRC speaking there. But he also tried to call them, and then they said, look, it appears that there are two factions of labor in, in most states. There's one, I think, uh, Comrade Fuegu, and then there's another faction. So that clearly is the case. But some of the things we also hear from the state is that uh, they say the president of NLC is violating a court order. And so why would he come and gather when the courts have said you cannot gather? And so I think the state or some persons, the police also have that judgment, so to speak. So, but the thing that, which is part of what the NRC was talking about there, but assuming, you know, without considering that that's the case, but haven't seen that video. Oh, by the way, Serap also put up a statement, which we'll, we'll take a look at soon. But I thought the IGP, they were having a conference in the state some time ago. Yes, I don't know they, if it's they, still they, going on. Yes, they had a conference on Monday yeah, where that embarrassing edition of a uh, rendition of the National Anthem. Oh. Was given. So there are questions about how the conduct of the police, the state government, and if some say even labor themselves on this kind of matter. So even if, assuming he violated the court order, are they allowed to take laws into their hands and say, we're going to brutalize you because you are violating the court order you're not supposed to gather? So if that were the case, if police claim that they're taking him into protective custody, putting him away from the thugs, so what then happened in the custody? Because he's saying there that it was when he was there that that happened. And if that's the case, then there are big question marks. So it doesn't come across because yes, two days ago, I was there about when we had the governor of River State saying the police, some of them were shooting at him. And then you get to see this, where they're accusing the police being under the supervision or being plied by the governments, using them as instruments to brutalize labor. So I'm not sure that that's the image the police wants the Nigerians to have. Because if it's now about the highest bidder, who can pay the police to do a job? That's the way this is coming across. So, are they a private security? Um, so, you know, and even if they were, would their job to be to inflict harm? So that's on this, is, this is the issue. 
Now, who are those talks? I mean, the Labour mentioned names of some of those talks. That's police supervising, means they know this kind of people who are doing these things. So if that's the case, and then they're going to have elections there, what do you expect people to think? And look, if they are controlling thugs, supervised by the police, look, you can say all you want about the elections. They only see the signs of what is going to happen. So it's how they intend to address all of these matters. It's going to be very, very serious for them to do. But no matter what happens here, no one, no one is allowed to take laws into their hands. Even if anyone breaks the law, the courts are the ones to adjudicate and ensure that the police then enforces the decisions of the courts. Not one individual or a group of people who think, no, you're breaking the law, so we can deal with you because of that. That's not right. Uh, yeah, Sarah, I've gone ahead and said, look, uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at what they've said here because they also monitored what transpired and they say the Tunubu administration must immediately identify, arrest and bring to justice those responsible for the arbitrary arrest and ill treatment of NLC President Joe Ajiru. Authorities must allow Nigerian workers to exercise their human rights. This impunity must stop. So, so many things going on, and I'm hoping that today, uh, moving forward, there will be a lot more commentary about all of this. But we all know that the president cannot allow these kind of things to go on. It's not, we're not in a jungle. I say, well, there are rules, there are laws, and they must be obeyed because if people were now to begin to arm themselves, saying, well, if those groups of persons are under the supervision and control of the state, then we have to help ourselves too, because nobody wants to be brutalized and left you know, with nothing to protect themselves, which is not the kind of message they want to send. So all of these things, got to address them. All right, let's take a look at some of the dailies. Uh, today we'll start with Vanguard newspaper. And so some of the images you've seen uh, opening here, it's also on the front page here. But look at the lead story. Foreign debt to top $51 billion as Tinubu seeks fresh $7.8 billion, $100 million loan. What? $100 million loan. Okay. Total public debt to hit $130 trillion naira as World Bank commits over $11 billion in three years in Nigeria. It says it's time country to rise to full potential. Financial experts warn against new borrowing. FG now operating in debt trap. Subscribe to President Adorni. So I want to go ahead and see all of these things here. So that's the image you see there. Bitten up. President of the Nigeria Labour Congress, NOC, Comrade Joa Juro, as he looked in the aftermath of the labor protest in Imo State yesterday and then the story to that says emo labor protest one fear dead many injured and also president brutalized so that's what you see right here so um that uh and then non-performing ministers others will be sacked Dinobu warns that is the guardian a big part of fine guard here today well, I'm looking at New Telegraph and uh, look at this story there. Tenobu six Senate approval for $7.864 billion. Yeah, $7.864 billion. 100 million euro loan. So there are two separate monies we're looking at now. To finance, education, health, others says facility arranged during Buhari's administration. Borrowing source not stated. Senate confirms Chira as Auditor General of the Federation. Seven out of ten REC nominees. Okay, so the nominees have already been screened and cleared. With the speed of lightning. Wild men slept. <laughs> <laughs> that is something else because I didn't even hear it. <laughs> what a country we've got, you know. You know, I was saying this yesterday. Uh, come on, did they assemble at night? <laughs> did they meet like owls? What's going on? <laughs> well, attempt to find out. We'll ask and see what's happening today on the program. So. Stay with us. <laughs>
pages two and three will give you details. So seven out of ten wrecks. Don't forget that there's been very big controversy on the mm -hmm. uh, wrecks who have been appointed so far. You also see at the bottom here, Oweri labor protest, NLC president brutalized, hospitalized, rob of personal effects. Ajero was taken into protective custody. That's according to the police. Uh, you also see right there, palliative federal government allocates 210 billion naira for civil servants wage award. Uh, the story is right there. And um, there's a prediction here. JP Morgan sees stronger market for Nigeria. 815 naira to the dollar by year end. So they're hoping that the naira will appreciate uh, against the dollar by the end of the year. I think that we can leave it there for New Telegraph. Korea newspaper, well, the surprise is still, I don't, um, let's, let's just leave it as Chamberlain has said, to try to make some sense of it. This Nigeria newspaper this morning is making an announcement, well, reiterating or repeating an announcement the president made. Perform or quit. Dinobo reads riot acts to ministers at retreat, says he must succeed by all means necessary. Sets up results delivery unit. Well, that's the question we were asking the other day uh, from the essay to the president, the last time, Mark Boyer and uh, Chamberlain. Now that there is a results delivering unit, sounds like there is a monitoring unit for the deliverables. The story, details of which you'll find on page four, is right there inside this Nigerian newspaper. Allegations against Wiki malicious untrue, says Rivers Elders Council. That's beneath the picture on the front page. FCT minister warns social media propagandists receives three PDP governors. Issues will be resolved, says Fubara, approaches court to stop impeachment. That story is on page six of this Nigeria newspaper. And right beside the nameplate, World Bank spends over $11 billion in Nigeria in three years, says country director. And that story we highlighted earlier is right beside the picture. Emo NLC protest, one feared dead. A security agent's arrest release a jero. That story is on page five. This is why the media is there, to keep everyone accountable. That's this Nigeria newspaper this morning. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Nigerian Tribune today. Uh, Wiki, okay, well, Wiki opens up on Rivers Crisis as the lead story you've got there. Well, the picture, I know, see also there. But look at the writers here. It says, nobody can take away a political structure. Impeachment is provided for in the Constitution. Ooh, is that from him? Oh dear. Fubara gets caught snod restraining house on impeachment. Says nothing wrong if father and son have issues. Okay. Hmm. And then labor talks tough over brutalization. Arrest of NLC president in Imo. Wants Tinubu to call Ozadema to order. Ajiro was in protective custody, not arrested. Please, did they overpower the studies to and meet out this unleash this mayhem of which image you see it here? Overpower the custodians. <laughs> Wait, man, will there be will there ever be a time in the history of this country where talk of police wearing body cams will even occur? Well, so FRS is see. doing it already. So it's not exactly something that is strange or something that they have to go and copy from somewhere else. This, the FRS, the Federal Road Safety Corporation, they're already doing it. Right here in the same country. Right here in the same country. So it might not be far-fetched. After all, some persons in government earlier, previously, have spoken about structuring the police, making it a lot more accountable. And I know Senate, National Assembly, governors from at that time too, uh, eventually, both the Northern Caucus and the Southern Caucus did say, yeah, it's time for a police organization of the police. So if everybody's thinking along that line, you never know. 
just may, sooner rather than later, have these kind of things happen where a lot more accountability on the part of the police. I must succeed by all means, Tinubu says. Once ministers at cabinet retreats deliver or get sacked. They always say, ship up, ship out. So I think that the result delivery unit will be the friend of the media. Because people will be poking them all the time. What's the report? What's going on? Give us something. So, never know. That's Tribune this morning. I'm looking at uh, Daily Trust again for you. And uh, they have this anger over planned 7 billion naira renovation of Tinubu Shetima's residences. And that story is right there on the front page. First Lady's vehicles to gulp 1.5 billion naira. Citizens, Labour Party, CSOs kick. President, six National Assemblies nod to borrow 7.8 billion dollars, 100 million euros. So that story is right there on the front page. And they're also putting it in context that while we're borrowing for, whatever it is to say we're borrowing for, this is how much we're also spending or we intend to spend on the renovation of the home of the president. I thought it had already been done. Isn't that why it took so long for him to move to the villa? Well, I guess you thought wrong. Okay. That's what he did too. Which one is where you find details as to what renovation they're talking about, but the Daily Trust has details. I mean, I mean, and they put it on the front page there, seven billion naira renovation of Tinubu. They have the ones in Lagos. Shetima. Residences and things like that. Yeah. Let's leave it there for the paper. The Nigerian News Direct has on its front page Emo planned strike hits deadlock as violent mob attacks NLC president labor leaders. Um, well, anyway, that's it right there on the front page because sometimes we have too many questions this morning all begging for answers. Attack on president and attempted murder as ascribed to NLC. We did not arrest NLC president, but shielded him from life-endangering attack. That's according to Imo police. Gosh, there's too many questions here. As Nupeng threatens nationwide strike. Uh-oh. Well, details you'll find on page 21 of the paper this morning. And above the nameplate, that uh, story is also reiterated. Tinubu threatens to sack underperforming ministers, tasks them on performance. And that story is on page four of the Nigerian News Direct this morning. Defense minister under fire as protesters storm National Assembly demand removal of Matawale. Where is that coming from? Where is that going? Find the details on page four of the Nigerian News Direct this morning. OAU raid. Students storm EFCC Ibadan office as university sends delegation to intervene. Find that story on page seven among several others on the inside pages. That's the Nigerian News Direct this morning. I wonder what new information those protesters have for former Governor Matawale. Wow. Okay. I'll take a look at Daily Times. As workers set for protests, gunshots, brutality in Imo, as thugs, police, manhandle NLC presidents. That's what they lead with here. Uh, hospitalized right eye shot. Uzodema's aid leads arrest of labor leader. TUC NOC report governor report governor to Tinubu vow to shut down state. We took him for protection, ascribed to the police. Outrage against governor days to election. Well, they said the governor is not a violent person, so if one of his aides is associated here, then he's got to say something and clarify. You have to let the air on this matter because it comes across as though it happened under his watch. And he might have supervised or in the know or something because, I mean, yesterday we had the president say box stops at his table. It's the same thing here. The box stops at the governor's table. So were his aides really there? Why were they there? If the governor knows about this, what is he going to do about it? Is he aware of this in the first place? So several questions really about this. That's Daily Times. Oh. No, don't let me say what is on my mind. But Business Day uh, seems to be continuing from where Daily Trust stopped. Because we, we saw 7 billion naira for renovation of 
presidential houses. Mm -hmm. um, business day has this presidential yacht. Yeah, you heard right. Oh, the president has a yacht. I, I didn't know that too. So, um, before those, presidential yacht, luxury cars in extra budget, draw flack. The president has a yacht? Where is it yacht, yacht into? I mean, we're still talking presidential jets that we should reduce the number. Then we now see a yacht. I mean, I've never even, in, in the, how many years that I have seen us cover the president. I've never heard that the president went on, went by boat to any community. Uh, maybe he went, if he did, maybe he was conveyed there by the military, maybe visiting the Niger Delta. But a presidential yacht, I thought that was something that they used for cruises and... A yacht can never be in the Niger Delta. <laughs> certainly not in the Niger Delta. So precisely where is the president's yacht into? Is it something that they're about to buy or something they're thinking of? What are we thinking about? In a time when oh, people boy. are struggling to buy petrol, I think we need to get our priorities right. Uh, but it's on the front page of business. This is not rumor mongering. This is the front page of a serious business paper. Um, and I think that, you know, needs to be taken very seriously. And those who are responsible for our budget, need, they need to speak up on these things. Um, Seven billion naira on renovation. Precisely what are we renovating? Is it the houses they're already living in? Is it the Aso Villa house? And if there is a presidential yacht, well, I'm just reviewing Business Day. It's right there on the front page of Business Day. Uh, Tinubu seeks lawmakers nod to borrow $7.91 billion. And you know the good thing about business papers, they know how to summarize the numbers for you even more clearly. So while you see on the front pages of other papers, 7.864, which is a mouthful. If you were to just round that off, which is normally what you do in mathematics anyway, uh, you're looking at roughly $7.9 billion. So are we looking for $7.9 billion to fund this sort of lifestyle for our leaders? Is that what we're looking for? Big question. Um, they have other stories right there. Business activity shrinks, nears Naira crunch levels. And you see right there, Nigerians devise survival tactics amid economic woes. Oh, uh, we're going to leave it there for business day. Oh, the leadership newspaper this morning. And what do you have on its front page? Well, Mark, where that answer of whether or not it's a purchase or a renovation is right there. FG budget, 33 billion naira for presidential yachts, vehicles, computers, others. Um, well, let me go straight to that one of um, the yacht. Well, that um, image, uh, you know, graphic representation on the front page, among others, 5.095 billion naira for the acquisition of a presidential yacht. That's it. So it's brand new. In fact, um, the leadership newspaper gives you an idea in case you don't know what a yacht looks like on the front page. So it's not just a boat. And you know, we're talking about a presidential yacht. So you can imagine all the fixtures. I mean, that's going to come into it. And hey, guys, um, we have a bl blue economy coming, right? We have a blue economy in the country we're trying to exploit. Maybe, just maybe, it's one of those things that the president who used to go and um, explore all those things. But hey, what do I know? The National Assembly has a job to do right there as well. So that's it. That's the lead uh, story of the leadership newspaper this morning. Right above the nameplate, those two stories have also made it there. Wiki has no hand in state assembly crisis, according to Rivers Elders. And right beside that one, Ajero battles to save right eye in Imo Hospital. Stories on page seven. I'm, I'm just trying to imagine what lit litigations can be avoided. The police is involved. Uh, some people have mentioned, the, uh, the NLC has mentioned the uh, Imo state government in this matter. 
I'm, 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 just, I'm just trying to imagine, but hey, I guess we'll have to wait for other things. So many other issues on the front page of the leadership newspaper, but let's leave it at that this morning for the leadership newspaper and a look at the dailies. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll begin to take a, take a look at the issues. Do stay with us. The 10 nominees for appointment as resident electoral commissioners are screened by the lawmakers. I just want to ask you one question. Just say yes or no. The zeal you put, and you had a wonderful thing in the civil service, which made you to become a permanent secretary, SSG, and so on and so forth. Will you repeat the same thing? If you are confirmed by this Senate, yes or, yes or no? Yes. We know there are some lacunas, particularly in the electoral act of uh, 2022 and we are now determined more than ever to ensure that uh, such lacunas are uh, covered. We are going to work together, hold our closed door sessions, review the, the laws generally, reject the electoral system so that they will be held more accountable for their actions. We have to make sure we bring a law that will work for Nigerians. However, three of the nominees are absent as the Senate concludes screening and subsequently confirms the seven nominees. Senate yesterday. So those two gentlemen are here with us in the studios. Mr. Jacob Pelle, CEO and founder, TAF Africa, and Samson Nitodo, Executive Director of Yaga. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Very Thank good you, morning. Gentlemen. Very good morning, Nigerians. Well, we did look at these matters, and when those names came up, the ones that had big question marks, many thought, no, it can't be happening again. Because I know during President Barry's time, there was a similar matter. And we thought uh, they might have learned a lot of lessons, and so we won't do the same thing. And then we see this again, but um, the peer have screened, declared some nominees yesterday. So you've been following. Well, what do you make of this then? Another, um, another opportunity for the president to write his name in gold uh, with all the issues he's struggling with. Uh, this would have been a very good opportunity for him to uh, put out names that he will not have to struggle with. And uh, unfortunately, we have uh, names that are very undemocratic, uh, individuals with uh, questionable character, and people that we know uh, will not serve the, the, the required uh, expectation of every and any Democrats. And uh, it's not too late for them to be withdrawn. Uh, the cases against them are very obvious. 
And uh, we have taken time, uh, thanks to uh, my very good friend here, Yaga uh, Samson, we did a thorough investigation. Uh, of course, being a lawyer, you know that he's thorough. Uh, we did a thorough investigation of these individuals, and they should not be uh, appointed. They shouldn't have been nominated in the first place. And uh, this, is, this is an opportunity for us to uh, rebuild the confidence, the battered confidence of, uh, of uh, the, the uh, past election, you know. And uh, I don't think this type of thing should come up now, you know. And so it's a simple, clarion call to the president to withdraw these individuals. Uh, they, they, they have become the, the dark sheep uh, amongst uh, uh, those who are appointed. Well, Samson, what do you know about this? Well, there's nothing that I know that Nigerians don't know. There are three things that we know. The first is, this is not the first time this is happening. It happened under President um, Harry, where he flooded the Electoral Commission with persons who had partisan inclination and persons who had um, questionable character. And um, he violated the Constitution, and he got away with it. It's repeating itself in the same fashion. But in fact, this time it's even worse. And so what we know to be different is the fact that you had a Senate who the day before yesterday read the communication from the president, read these names, and rather than commit or refer the matter to the Senate committee on INEC, because the committees are the engine room of legislative work. This is where due diligence is performed, especially for an institution like INEC. These are not ministerial appointees where you, you confirm them on, on the floor. You, the matter should have been referred. The Senate president refused you know, to refer the matter to the Senate committee, and they went ahead to confirm these people. There were petitions that were submitted you know, against these people, especially the two people, two nominees that we have raised flags, that Nigerians have raised flags, that the entire public space is flooded with images and videos of these individuals. And this is not too far from, from today. It was just 2019, less than five or six years down the line. These are individuals who are really out there in public who have professed their political preference and alienation alignment. And he went ahead and confirmed these people. But what it just simply tells us is that if we, we've got a democracy without Democrats. We have a democracy with individuals who do not care about people and do not care about our institutions. And I think it's heartbreaking that if you see what happened in the Senate yesterday, you just see how these guys are killing our institutions. How can you explain to a Nigerian that this person was confirmed by a democratic institution to serve as an umpire? And we've been screaming and shouting and advocating and telling our politicians that there is grave danger when INEC is populated by politicians. How do you expect them to superintend over elections and expect people to turn up to vote? Because for them, the outcome is already skewed. The second is it appears there is actually a grand conspiracy by the political class. And the big question is where, where are the opposition parties in this entire conversation? Why must it be civil society organizations and the media who constantly put these issues on the front burner. If you check the distribution of political parties in the Senate, the APC has majority. But you have over 30 PDP lawmakers. You also have Labour Party lawmakers. The big question is, why didn't they oppose either this breach of procedure or this appointment of partisan individuals? Because the whole concept of confirmation is a derivative of the principle of separation of power. 
that in a constitutional democracy, yes, the executive, the president has the power. He's made this appointment. But the protective mechanism within the legislature that should check, you know, the excesses of the executive is now weakened. And you have opposition party members. Did they speak up? Did they oppose this move? Either the procedure that was adopted by the Senate or the nomination of this individual. To the best of my knowledge, I have not seen any letter from the opposition or political parties. I have not seen any petition. And so every time people say, oh, what is civil society doing? Everybody is abdicating their responsibility for civil society. And it just tells you that perhaps the reason why they are quiet is maybe it's a consensus on the part of the political class that one way to secure electoral victory is to capture the electoral management body. Perhaps they, if, if given the opportunity, they probably will do the same. And that's why they are not speaking. And it's, it's troubling because we are damaging our institutions. And more importantly, is the Constitution. This is a gross violation of the Constitution. We can't claim, we can't have people who are creation of the Constitution desecrate the Constitution. The Constitution is clear that individuals who have partisan inclinations, who are members of political parties, should not be appointed into INEC. It's there in the letters of our Constitution. If you adopt, whether literal, whether um, textual, whatever canon of interpretation you adopt, it is clear to the blind man that people who are what, who have partisan leanings, and these two individuals that have been flagged, I don't know why they still insisted on confirming these people. And it's just sad and a very dark day for our electoral democracy. So I'm just trying to, you know, just get my head around this. The president sent this communication on, was it on Monday? Tuesday. On Tuesday. That was when we got to, and within that time, today is Thursday, um, in such a very short time, information quickly sipped out about the, uh, you know, the, the past or the background of some of these individuals. Mm. Some of them we actually have video clips of. Uh, you know, confessing their uh, affiliation with political parties. These clips, um, it will be very helpful if these clips can actually come up um, as, we, as we speak about them and as speaking to our producers. This is one clip of, you know, one of the uh, recs that has now been confirmed, right. Mr. Itikamba Umoren. Um, this is not a video, but this is a clip of him. I mean, you can see the picture right there. Clearly wearing the uh, uh, APC. Yeah, the APC uh, uniform or the uh, cloth, you know, depicting a political party. Yeah. This came up, and within that, people thought, oh, you know, maybe there was some mistake, and maybe when the Senate gets to hear this, because we also saw what happened in the Ninth Assembly when the president's spokesperson, one of the president's spokesperson was appointed, and, you know, the, the, we were up in arms. There was enough time for the public to be able to send their own petitions. Uh, and it was in that within the time between when the president sent his communication, within that short period, all has been done. I, I mean, even the media, I don't think we were aware <laughs> that that kind of confirmation was going to happen yesterday, because I was just asking my colleague, did this happen at night? Uh, it would seem that while we were mm. still paying attention to what was happening with the president, we expected you know, normal process doing a bond with his, his ministers and starting a retreat, this was actually scheduled to hold without much noise. Uh, and then you've raised very pertinent questions about the role of the opposition in the National Assembly. Can they say that they did not see this? If everybody else missed it, wouldn't it be or shouldn't it have been in their own interest? Uh, because this jeopardizes their own chance of being able to return to the National Assembly. Is there a reason why it would appear that civil society seems to be crying louder than the opposition? Yeah, well, I, yeah, well, it's obvious. Um, um, we have, uh, we, money has not exchanged hands. Nobody is giving us anything. And, in, you know, I, one, one will say, well, you don't, you don't have uh, evidence. But... I, I, Samson raised a very important uh, issue, and that's the opposition 
uh, political parties who are in the National Assembly. We expected them to take this up and speak loudly, uh, but they are keeping quiet. And it's, it's surprising to me. Uh, is it a statement to say, well, when it's our turn, we'll do the same thing, you know? Or they just decided to look the other way. Do you ever you know? think that it will ever get to their turn? Well, <laughs> it's who knows? Their turn. Could the also this... Electro, well, just a moment. If mm -hmm. the electoral umpire is such that it is steeped in the colours mm -hmm. of, of the ruling party, will it ever get to the turn of the opposition or they're not seeing it at all? Or, or they all intend to join the ruling party? Unfortunately, it's like wherever... <laughs> Whatever the ruling party says or does is what everybody would do. But, but you see, like, like my colleague said, they are grossly undermining the institution of democracy and people that will grow up to be interested in the process. It's unfortunate. I keep saying it. You know, the insensitivity of this president, the insensitivity of, of uh, the Senate president and all the leadership why would they keep quiet and obvious evidence? You don't need to be a lawyer. You don't need to be a judge to see that there are very, very meaningful, impactful evidence against these individuals. Okay. Or could it be that um, it's another way of compensant, compensating the people? You know, there are other ways you can do this other than bringing them. This is an embarrassment to democracy. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm shocked also, I'll be shocked how INEC will receive these people and work with them, knowing fully well that they are... Do they have a choice in the matter? Well, well, I, 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 I don't know. know. Maybe... Sure. maybe. They, well, <laughs> they don't have a choice. They're, they're not the appointing authority. The appointing authority is the president. The president has made the appointment, and the Senate has confirmed. The next procedure is the Senate will and communication to the president, um, and then um, they will, the, the SGF will send them their appointment um, letters, and then the INEC chairman will swear them in, because resident electoral commissioners, you know, are sworn in by, um, by, the, by the INEC chairman and then other national commissioners. And this has also raised, and quite frankly, just to think about this, I look at the opportunities. Perhaps this whole advocacy about whether we actually need Rex, you know, um, 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 it, it moving forward is something that we need to consider. Why should the president be appointing Rex? Why shouldn't INEC have, you know, directors and those directors manage the elections? It's the same way. The president only appoints the IG of police, but he doesn't appoint commissioners of police. It is the police that appoints um, commissioners of police and deploy them at the at the will and wishes of the IG, um, subject to uh, you know certain conditions, and so that can be applied because this whole point, if and quite frankly, if this process of appointment you know is reviewed, um, it, it will ask, address some of these. You can't have someone who you know belongs to a political party, and you know what, even for the APC. This does not even tell it's well of you them. as a yeah. political party. It doesn't tell well of your legacy. It doesn't tell well of your disposition and your commitment to democratic institutions. Sure. It's not good for political legitimacy because there's no election that these individuals will conduct that would have any legitimacy. That's even if people show up in the first place to cast their vote. Mm. I am just a little curious now. I'm, I'm looking at the fact that... I, Two questions actually bother my mind. One is whether there's any remedy. If indeed, from what we saw on national television, these gentlemen have been, yeah, this is the video. Go listen to the little let's, let's, let's listen to this video. If... Hey, let me just say, hey, you are secretary to come in until January. Thank you. From today, have you accepted that acquired women should become APC? And um, all things are passed away. If you say to collect the broom, wave to the crowd here and tell them that they are in safe hands. You are a technocrat of the highest order. They take a more model. You didn't pass secretary to second. ABC! Change! ABC! Change! Acquire 
you are in safe hands. Let me not waste your time. But let me just say. So you hear right there. That is, is that a the, ghost? Is that a ghost? Oh, that's the, the current Senate president. That was sometime in 2019 when uh, the, the SSG, then SSG, defected yeah. from the PDP to the All Progressives Congress in 2019. So two questions, as I said, bothered my mind. Because the first is that what the Constitution states is that you, can, you must not be card-carrying members of any political party. Some might argue that, oh, they have since resigned their membership of political parties. Can individuals still qualify as, you know, being fit to be resident electoral commissioners if they have resigned their membership of political parties? Let me uh, take, have your take. Well, well, I'll speak on a moral ground because I'm not a lawyer. Samson is. Um, morally speaking, uh, if for any reason you resign from a political party, and you're well known to have interest in that political party. Resignation is just what you've done on a piece of paper. There is no proof that you don't have interest in what that political party will do or will, will, will do going forward. So for me, on a moral ground, if you want to take the high moral ground, I will not want to be part of anything that aligns me to that political party, morally speaking. Uh, and I think there's also issue where there, there is a, a convergence between morality and legality. But uh, my colleague, who is a lawyer, will speak more on that. But for me, as an individual, what is tenable, I will not take it. I think that there is a remedy. And the remedy is... You're speaking to the remedy already. I want, okay. you to, I want you to speak to whether or not, because if they, if they say, look, okay, yes, he, he, he defected, but he's since resigned even that of the APC. Now, some people will say, well, he's been in APC, he's been in PDP, so maybe he's for both of them and he's for nobody. Uh, shouldn't that suffice to, as to some neutrality that he could possibly show? Now, if we look at this from a legal standpoint, the Constitution is clear that you must not be a registered uh, member of a political party. And so, to that extent, if a claim he resigned his membership from a political party before he was appointed, and I guess that's the claim they are making, but they need to go back to the Electoral Act and what the Electoral Act says. When it was introducing sanctions there were, there were provisions in the 2022 electoral that sought to protect the neutrality of INEC officials. And it said whether you are a member or you are connected to any political party, it doesn't say whether, it doesn't say, it doesn't limit, you know, the issue to membership or whether you are linked or you are aligned with a particular political party and you don't disclose and it is an offense. And that's the provision of the Electoral Act. But when it comes to the question about appointment, one of the gaps in the law, which I foresee, or I, I see you know, them exploiting, is that there's no law that says you must have been, um, um, there's a moratorium on, on, on the membership of political party within a certain timeline. So you can be a member of a political party today, resign today, and be appointed tomorrow, and it still fulfills, you know, the law. But our society isn't just about laws. It's about there's something, there's, there's, there's the philosophy behind that constitutional threshold of non-partisanship. And when the law says non-partisanship, it means that Heineck is an umpire, is one who superintends over a process that involves two or more than two or more than one opposing sides. Therefore, for the confidence of all sides, it is important that individuals who have never had any affiliation with any political party are, should be appointed. But when you've obnubbed, you've been a member, you've held several positions, you become a member of a political party, it undermines the integrity and the independence of the Electoral Commission, and that's the point being made here, that when you electoral outcomes ought 
to confer legitimacy, you know, on people who are elected from office. But if people don't believe that the process is credible, there is no way they're going to accept the outcome of the elections. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why people are disengaging from this process is the fact that you have a political class that doesn't care about the rules. All they care about mm -hmm. is whether they secure political power at all costs. And it's sure. not good for our democracy. Mm -hmm. well, no, 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 real quick. Uh, we'll, talk talk about about we'll, we'll talk about Remedy. We'll talk about when we yeah. come yeah. back. Okay. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> just hang on. Yeah. There's a lot more to on Earth in just a moment. Don't go away. Thank you for staying with us. Well, Mr. Itore, let me come back to you here. Um, so I'm looking at the Constitution, as you mentioned the other time. Uh, third schedule, part 1F, uh, is about the Independent National Electoral Commissioner. Um, 14 sub 3 says there shall be for each state of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory Abuja a resident electoral commissioner who shall A, be appointed by the president subject to the confirmation by the Senate, B, be a person of unquestionable integrity and shall not be a member of any political party, and C, not be less than 35 years of age. Is there any chance that the president's office and the Senate, particularly the president of the Senate, could have missed this? Well, I don't think that the president could have missed it. And the reason is, if you check the statement from the presidency, the first paragraph in the first list referred to the relevant sections of the Constitution. And so I don't think they missed it. I don't even think that it was misinterpreted. I personally think that this is deliberate. Um, it was intentional. Um, because Nigerians need to know that there are actually three different lists. The first list that came out from the official handle of the, the, the government had nine names. Um, that list was withdrawn 24 hours later. Another list was published with 10 names. And then some names were replaced. Um, the names from AKT, uh, for Quara. Um, and I think we won other state. Now, when the names were read on the floor on Tuesday, two names were also substituted, one from Niger and then one from Zamfara. So technically, within the last one week, there have been three different sets of, of lists. There are some names that have been consistent. And so I don't think that, um, you know, it's... Um, um, it's they, they could have missed it. Because let's look at the first list. The first list, there are some names. And the moment that name was released, citizens started speaking out. And I give it to the president. Some of those names were actually withdrawn. But it's bewildering that these two nominees, the one from Akwaibom and Edo, who, have, who it's a matter of public knowledge, you know, have been partisan. And you can clearly see from the video that was shown. Now, why? they insist to proceed with this? And why we need to look at the Senate is, I've talked about the separation of powers. The reason for confirmation is to ensure due diligence, is to ensure that the appointments made by the president fall within, um, uh, it's in compliance with the provisions of the Constitution. The Senate that should have reason to protect the Constitution did fail in its responsibility. Okay. And they are the ones who have a responsibility for making laws. So they know. Okay. You well, know, Mr. Itoro, um, ju just one second. Law, on that very issue that you just raised now, um, first of all, um, the president of the Senate and chairman of the you know, Committee of the Whole is a former governor who, in that video that we saw, was making the announcement and calling this gentleman that we have, that's been flagged by Nigerians out now. Now, um, how much of an indictment would you say that is 
on the person and office of the President of the Senate as at today? No, uh, in terms of an indictment, it's, again, it's a matter of public knowledge that this individual, one of these individuals, and the nominee for Macquarie Bomb, you know, worked closely with the Senate president. He served as his chief of staff while he was a minister of the Niger Delta. You know, and you can see from that video. And it's really unfortunate. And I don't think that um, the Senate president, by this action, has written his name in gold. Instead, by this singular action that he took, it is clear, it is really, really clear that it's going to undermine our electoral democracy and undermine the neutrality of the independent National Electoral Commission because it's obvious that it is protege. Mm. And you, you can't, you just, it's inexplainable. I, I, quite frankly, I don't know how Nigerians are actually receiving this, that someone who was an aide of the, of the Senate president, you know, is confirmed. This was the same issue that citizens rose against when former President um, Buhari appointed his aide, you know, as a national commissioner of INEC. Mm. So to a very large extent, it's unfortunate, and I think it was a missed opportunity for the Senate president um, to deepen the quality of our electoral process. But this singular action mm. is further going to deepen you know, the crisis of confidence um, that INEC and our electoral process currently have. Okay. And it's just really clear. And again, I want to make the point that I think the senators also let the Senate president have its way. And I don't know what happened in the, in the, whether in executive session, in whatever session, but the senators of good conscience rise up to speak. I know that people, I know people in the Senate who are not happy with this decision. But why are they not speaking out? Is the legislature also captured, like other democratic institutions? If they speak out, is there going to be a reprisal? Because one thing I expected was, if the Senate president insisted on a particular procedure, what should have happened was some of the senators who opposed this would have come out to the public and say, we stand and we oppose it. We've seen that happen at the House. But since there was no such action, I just think that perhaps there was just consensus on the floor to adopt the same procedure. Okay. Let me quickly ask uh, Mr. Pele. Well, you, you, your, your colleague there said the other time that the Senate, by this appointment, even though a letter was sent to, this, to the Senate concerning this particular matter, they themselves went ahead and approved, and as he, to use his, some of his words, the Senate did not do due diligence. First of all, do you agree with him? And if you do, and this has happened now, what, should there be a consequence? Should there be an adjustment to the law? To, what, what do you think could be wrong here? Uh, thank you very much. Let, two things. Uh, no, number one, um, if any of them are playing to the gallery and trying to give us this excuse that, well, this individual resigned, what about the integrity question? It's very obvious, you know, that these two gentlemen, uh, would I call them gentlemen, uh, are of questionable character, you know. And that is a, a enough reason for um, their nomination never to go through. But however, the issue of um, the remedy. Now, Mr. President, maybe you're watching. Let me say that true leaders, great leaders, have learned to make decisions and reverse themselves. There is still remedy. You can reverse this. There's nothing wrong in you saying, well, we're, we're recalling this individual. He cannot go forward. That will give you a thumbs up uh, by the citizens who are watching you. And like my colleague says, the confidence of even the forthcoming uh, uh, of cycle election is at stake. Uh. And if we must rebuild this confidence, we must also ensure that we don't make this kind of very obvious mm. mistakes that, that turns our hearts and, 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 and rumbles mm. our, our stomach. Uh. You know? so, so there is an opportunity to reverse this if they choose to. But if you don't, this country, this 
citizens. All of us will continue to hold you accountable. And sometimes I, I begin to wonder whether this is a grand design to cure up themselves for 2027. Who knows? But we will continue to watch. Remember, it was the same, this, Samson, you remember, it was this same thing we uh, flagged up uh, about the rigs, that these individuals that they were not, uh, they didn't give attention to, nearly up to absolutely rigged the, the past election, you know? So, so we must be very careful and know that you are just there, voted by Nigerians, and one day you will leave that office. And this country will hold you accountable for the things you have done. I don't know how these guys sleep, you know, because I, I can't get involved in things like this and be able to have my peace. Well, and I'm what, sure all of them, yeah. this country will continue to hold you accountable. Well, just one, one, one other thing with you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to uh, uh, Mr. Itodo. Do you see a need? Mr. Itodo mentioned a gap that could have been... Um, exploited or that is probably being exploited, that the person should be non-partisan and the proof of partisanship would be membership of a political party. But if you are non-partisan, um, that means you probably have you know, left a political party. But Mr. Itoto said that there isn't a time given in the law that, okay, between social time and social time, uh, you, should, you must have left for maybe five years or 10 years before you can be appointed a member of, uh, you know, INEC to be a part of the electoral uh, system. Do you see a need to adjust the Electoral Act in particular to the effect? Well, the lawyers will say <laughs> a leading question. This is a leading question. Capital, yes. Uh, there's a need for us to interrogate uh, the current sets of laws and the clauses and the provisions and see how to tweak them to accommodate the very, not just the legality uh, of, of, of the provisions, but the morality of the provisions. You know, um, like I said, you cannot say to me, um, you are a member of a political party uh, by, by today and tomorrow you will resign just because you want to be appointed. That is criminality, you know, and, and people like that uh, should not be holding uh, public office. And like I said, let's even look away from this issue of whether he resigned or not. Or not. What about the integrity question? What about uh, 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 very, very obvious uh, uh, issues around how these individuals have managed public funds and all that? And I think... It's, it's important that character should come first in any individual who wants to hold public office. You cannot be, character is what you are in the dark, you know, and we know what these individuals are in the dark and it's coming to the open. Okay. So, yes, we need to interrogate the laws. Yes, we need to repeal and replace, you know, and I'll leave that to the lawyers. But mm -hmm. like I said, the responsible thing to do. Some of these individuals, do they have conscience? Well, well, when, perhaps, when perhaps, all these things are in the open. Yeah, perhaps can't you know you one, walk of those, away one of those. One of those issues. In a position, yeah, you know, if you truly want to serve this country, you can't serve with this kind of baggage. Okay. And well, we let me let me quickly like ask said, Mr. Itodo, for my colleagues, uh, with you there, take over, Mr. Itodo. This is where we are now. Where do we go from here? Well, I totally agree that um, the best place to go from here is to rescind this action that has been taken. Um, the remedy isn't to let these individuals go into INEC because we've not recovered from the electoral coup that almost um, took place in Adamawa during the last elections. We've also not recovered from what happened in Sokoto. We've not recovered from what happened in Abia. And so these experiences should teach us a big lesson about the individuals that are appointed into INEC. His action is totally unacceptable, and it's an assault on the Constitution, as well as an effort to undermine our democratic institutions, as well as capture INEC. So it needs to be stated, and, and this can be remedied. Um, and there are several ways that that can be done. Yes, the confirmation 
um, has been um, processed, but the law is also clear. The Constitution is clear on the removal of these individuals. And the same Senate that confirmed him, the same Senate can also remove him based on an address by the president. That's what the Constitution says. The second is the fact that we need to amend the relevant sections of our Constitution, as well as the Act. In the last dispensation, there was an attempt to sponsor a bill that you know, really limits, um, that creates a time frame within which an individual should have um, stop being a member of a political party, or even after being a, an official of INEC before you transit into politics. Because if you recall, you know, in, before the 2019 elections, the resident electoral commissioner for Bainway resigned from INEC, and a few weeks later, he became a governorship candidate of the, of the, of the APC. The same thing also happened be, before that, um, the wreck for Cross River also um, resigned, um, just weeks before um, the primaries to contest for election. So there is actually a gap within our law. And so we need to bring back that particular bill, but more importantly, amend the sections of our constitution. And the last sort of proposal is that this incident that has happened in the last 48 hours reinforces the need to strip, well, reinforces the need to review the appointments um, of individuals into INEC. Justice Ways Committee, you know, clearly articulates a procedure, but I think after 13 years, we've learned big lessons from just observing elections that we may not go the Justice Ways Committee's route. We need to tweak that recommendation. But to continue to vest the power of appointing national commissioners, the chairman of INEC, resident electoral commissioners, I think it's not best for our democracy. Resident electoral commissioners shouldn't be appointed by the president. We should just have directors of elections or regional directors of elections that are appointed by INEC to manage these elections and it, not create these processes that gives politicians opportunity to capture INEC. Well, we, we need to wrap up, but uh, there are several questions really about yeah. this one. For instance, I mean, is uh, Etek Amba Omora and the cousin of the president of the Senate, Gozul Bora Pabio, are they from the same local government area? Did he go with him to the Nigerian ministry as an aide while he was there? Mm. Is it right for him to preside over his appointment if he was his aide at the time? Mm. Will he be posted to Akwaibom State? I mean, we all know that Akwaibom State is governed by the PDP and the Senate president is APC. And so if he goes to Akwaibom State, you know what you likely expect. So, mm. And then when, gentlemen, you were asking, what about the opposition? Did they say anything or not? And I thought, look, uh, these chaps, could they also be that they have their members, they've been promised their members in the same pay place? I mean, is Dr. Onoha, who is a rep of, uh, from River State, is he a member of PDP, for instance? That those who say, look, they've seen his images as one who campaigned for the PDP at the time. So... Just look at all well, these it things. It would seem that he's typifying, I mean, that's uh, Mr. Etekamba, is typifying, uh, you know, just what we see in the list. Because, you know, as you... And I, that's something we, some people will say, that if the idea is neutrality, shouldn't we have, like, a situation whereby we have uh, people, their names are published, and then you have the public raise objections exactly. if they're partisan? Or should we just go back to what we had before? where the people who were Rex were non-party members. Because mm. some people will say right. that, look, we're, we're complaining because we can see clearly that they are partisan people. But what if they were closer party people? How were we? Is it because they're wearing the uniform? What about those who actually do, who are yeah. even more partisan mm. than the party members or can be compromised right. by, by the political parties? Do you think that we should have more thoughts on this? neutrality thing? Can people ever be truly neutral? Well, I, I, I agree with you. There's a need to uh, scrutinize um, all of the provisions and, and the, the, the path that we want to take. But I align myself with my colleague that I think it's high time we begin to push for these uh, so-called rakes that rakes the elections and the process to be set aside. And we begin to train people in INEC to take these responsibilities as directors. Over time, they will gain the skills, they will gain the confidence of the people. We will know that there's no way they will get in, themselves involved, at yeah. least publicly, 
in, in political uh, party affairs. All right, so uh, it's clear for everybody to see if this is a progressive decision taken by the old progressive Congress. Mm. I guess uh, your view out there will be huge importance. So we'll look to see and keep tabs on all of this matter. But gentlemen, well, thank you for coming on. Samson Nitodo, Executive Director of Yaga, and uh, Mr. Jacob Pelle, CEO and founder of Half Africa. We're back in a moment. Stay on with us. All right, welcome back. Yes, indeed, uh, La Loire Conde, former presidential aide, as well as uh, uh, Omar Benda, who is an engineer, and also former national coordinator, National Social Investment Program, the NSIP, also former secretary to the Adama State Government. They both join us here in the studios. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. morning. Result delivery unit, that, that sticks out, you know, mm -hmm. in that particular retreat that they're holding. But let me even ask you, what kind of impact this kind of retreats ever have? Well, uh, to, to the extent that uh, it, it creates uh, a forum where the president can do two things. One, and make his, uh, uh, his, his agenda very clear to the ministers and how serious he is about delivering. Important. And secondly, it shows the nation that, uh, that the president and his team have a way to kind of organize some kind of measurement and evaluation. I think for those two reasons, it's, 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 it's very important to gather around and to think through these things. But what, what, what I think uh, is even more important is the fact that if you listen to the speech of the president, mm -hmm. he did say that he's not perfect. And, and that's a very important thing to say because, as you will find out, the work of nation building the work of national development, we often require all hands on deck. That is why it's very important for the president to do two things. Number one, keep an eye on the ministers on a very regular basis. And then secondly, he himself has to open himself up to critical views. Look, this is a democracy. You cannot shut yourself out from people or sources where you can be spoken to directly especially because of your own pedigree as a progressive and as a Democrat. So I think it's important, you know, just as he is uh, 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 putting uh, the, the issues down to the minister and say, look, if you don't perform your heart, very important point. But he must also open himself up to critical views. You must, you must have people who can tell you, Mr. President, that is not the right path. Because just if you don't have that, then it's going to be a tunnel vision. Just as people have said, well, yeah, nobody's perfect. We make mistakes. But the important thing is if those mistakes are made, they have to be corrected. Yeah. So uh, maybe he might like to start with the Senate, the confirmation of those wrecks. So mm -hmm. if it's a mistake on his part, if he didn't know, I'm uh, hoping, expecting that perhaps his hangers on or age would have brought it to his attention that the country mm -hmm. has seen some of these things and they are clearly mistakes that need to be corrected. So we'll look to see yeah, and, if and, and, we'll take that yeah, on board. And, and it's, I think that's a very important point. Uh, and I, I wanted to say this, uh, make this point that, look, Nigerians must understand that this is a democratic system. If government does something that is not acceptable, Nigerians have the power to stop it. You cannot have, for God's sake, somebody who served the Senate president as a chief of staff, take it to the government. You cannot bring that guy to INEC we have over 200 million people in this country. It is completely unacceptable. And if Nigeria insists, the president will have to rescind. Okay. So do, do you know why the last government, various government, didn't have resort delivery units? They did have. I mean, there, did there they was, have? There, there, there was a uh, resort. We never delivery. heard of it. Yeah. So, so uh, which, which, is, which is the problem because uh, then the, the, the communication lines uh, just got blurred at a point. I remember that the president uh, did set up uh, a delivery unit, uh, one in the office of the executive the government of the federation and one in the presidency. But the wow. communication of it was not effective. And so uh, nobody knows what, what the results are. They don't talk about the result. If you, if, if you set a, a KPI, you must mm -hmm. give a timeline. And when the time comes, the people must know okay. that this has been achieved and this has not been achieved. Mr. Bindo, I mean, you, an engineer, you know, you, you, engineers have ways of doing their things. Mm. They, they make sure that the design is perfect for you to build certain things and move on. I mean, your days of no tap, you, 
you talked about several scenarios and then you moved on to different units in government. What do you even expect from this retreat and result-wise now from the government? Thank you very much. I, I think uh, one thing that Nigerians should take from this particular activity is that we're beginning gradually to mature on building institutions to win. This is not new. Retreat is not new. The delivery unit is not new. And it was started by the past uh, administration. In fact, it's not just in the office of the secretary to the government or um, uh, in the office of the vice president. Every minister in every ministry was directed in the last administration to establish their own uh, result delivery unit. And it's not just that. Every year there is a, a retreat to bring all the information back in front of everybody to say that this ministry, everybody, you're like, yeah. The a media retreat. part of this? Yes, the media is part of it. The, the media, everybody, you are lagging behind, you are lagging, and it's there. They have a chart. The federal government level? Yes. Wow. In there in the villa, we used to attend this, I attended two, you know, where the whole chat, there is a team, totally team of consultants, uh, independent, that will come to your ministry, check the, the template, check what you have delivered, and mark you literally like an exam, and then display it at that retreat. It has happened twice. But anyway, so that is one thing that Under the Buhari administration? Yes. Yes, go and check the records. So, but anyway, I'm, I'm really struggling to check my own mental well, records. In the office, <laughs> the media was ever the former present. secretary to the government, was Mustafa, organized these two. He was the head of the whole thing. We went. The wow. president was there. They will call all this World Bank, all this internet, all ambassadors, all uh, ministers. You deliver, and there's a document. I think if you ask the office of the secretary to the government, you will even get the document that graphically showcasing you bar charts of red. Amber and okay. green, they follow the track of it. I, I, I think the thing that has to change uh, is that you have to communicate the results publicly. Okay? There has to be a way to communicate. And, and I made the point. These are the timelines. These are the KPIs. When we get to the time, we must tell the people what has happened. That is what is missing. But the, but yeah, the, um, yeah, some people also say consequences. Because here, we also hear the president tell his ministers directly. First, we understand that he told them that if you cannot work with the results, um, the yeah, results yeah. unit, delivery unit, you had, you know, then you have better leave. Because this is the person who's going to be heading it and, you know, she's going to be on your, on your, on your case for that. That's one. And then two, if you don't deliver, if, if, first of all, said, if you don't deliver on the objective, it will review. But if you fail outrightly, you need to leave us. So do you think that what was missing wasn't just the fact that, okay, uh, these uh, KPIs were set and, you know, they were evaluated, but the fact that there were no consequences? I mean, throughout the Buhari administration, I, I can only remember two ministers who were fired throughout the eight years that he, he largely left his ministers, and some of them were even returned for a second, some of the longest seven ministers mm -hmm. we've ever had. So do you think that this was a matter of uh, consequence, which is not exactly a bad idea. I think when we say longest seven ministers, people think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some people say no, not necessarily a bad thing. If you don't perform, thing. it's bad. Yeah, but if you don't perform, it's, yeah. it's terrible. It shouldn't be <laughs> it's, it's that terrible. long. So do you think that what really, really happened was that there were no conse consequences for those who were not delivering? I think this is, again, Nigeria should take, uh, what Nigeria should take away from this is that in governance, you cannot get everything right from the first shot. This thing started. We saw what happened during the Buhari administration. The uniqueness of this retreat, people don't sort of remember and recall. In, 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 um, uh, from Buhari's first and second tenures, the retreats after the appointment of ministers was immediate. You are appointed minister, and from the appointment, they just go on retreat. They call the permanent secretaries. These ministers had the privilege for four months or three, four months to move into their offices, interact with their permanent secretaries, get handing over notes, read them before the retreat. So this has edged the procedure to allow you to come here prepared, knowing the mandate of your ministry. Second, the president introduced another thing that people did not note. It used to be Wednesdays, Federal Executive Council. Now it's Mondays. And do you know the implication of having it on Monday? What? Ministers don't have clean weekends anymore. 
You have to be reading memos during your Saturdays and Sundays. Before you are relaxed weekend, you come back on Monday, there are memos. You can read it Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday you go for Federal Executive Council. Now you cannot take the luxury of traveling to your hometown, doing politicking, and you have to take your memos because the president normally will say, Maupe, uh, uh, what is the, the, your comment on this memo? There's no, no drama about it. So if Ministry of Health presents a memo, and poverty alleviation has something to say with this. President does not have to tell you that, hey, I'm going to ask you a question. You know, you'll just know that you have not read the memo. So this is another innovation. The third is that ministers traditionally, these are politicians, in most of them. There are very few uh, technocrats. There are some that overlap. But relationship with their permanent secretaries, who are the bureaucrats, who are the professional uh, um, uh, 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 people heading the bureaucracy, the accounting officers. Many of the politicians are not used to this because the permanent secretary is the due process person. You have to budget for things. You have to work within the envelopes. You have to write your procurement documentation before you do contracting. A politician who is new to this system finds this as a waste of time. It is blocking his progress. He wants to run now. I have money. I want to spend it now. So by staying for two, three months, some of the ministers have had this flavor of relationship with this bureaucrat. This retreat becomes more meaningful. So in my opinion, firing people, the president has said, the, uh, 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 when President Buhari was there, it was not very clear like this, that if you don't perform, we realize that you can be panel beaten to perform better. We will give you that opportunity. How much but time it, should it be given? Well, I think, for, as far as I'm concerned, ministers and the president meet every Wednesday. There is an opportunity to no, interact. Days, no. Okay, every we're in Monday now. So now the, this retreat is not just once a year. In those days, the retreats are quarterly or every twice a, a, a year, and therefore measuring the performance of a minister does not happen monthly. Does not happen bi-monthly. You need some time because remember, if I want to establish a hospital that will be part of my key performance indicator as a minister of health, you have to procure. You have to ensure that the money is available. You have to contra contractual obligation. This takes time. And there are, you have to get independent people to come and look at it. It's not you that will now say, I have done very well or I have not done very well. So mm -hmm. all these processes take time. But for me, it will be really nice to see uh, the, 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 the president owning up to these statements that he made. If you don't perform, we panel beat you to give you a second chance. If you really, really don't perform, we show you the way out. I hope by the time Nigerians will start commenting on the performance of the various sectors in agriculture for food security, in healthcare for health, in water for water, in budgeting and poverty elevation and so on, Nigerians will react. Mm. And when they react, I hope that uh, he will own up to what he said. Well, I, I hope that, you know, especially in the, we could just mention budgeting right now, because on the one hand, you hear the president's seem to be saying the right things at the retreat to his ministers. It, it looks like uh, he's uh, feeling the pulse of the people and he understands the urgency of the matters at, at hand, in terms of, especially in terms of the economy of the country and how his very first statement or his very first words in his inaugural address about subsidy being gone are having a, a spiral effect on the quality of lives that Nigerians are currently leading in terms of how much they earn, their spending capacity, et cetera. And then you now take a look at the dailies today, and they're telling you about a presidential yacht. They're telling you about seven billion naira for renovation, all in the same breath that we're using to talk about taking new loans, uh, some of them worth $7.9 billion. Let me just be confirming that, yeah. yeah. $7.9 billion. So you're wondering on the one hand, um, is there a disjoint? Is this, because I, I imagine that there's a whole department of government responsible for the budgeting for, you know, the entire country. And, and then, you know, and there's also the department that also takes care of the presidency. Is there a disjoint between what the president is saying, what he intends to do, and what perhaps is his, his ministers and his departments of agencies understand to be the priority um, of, or should be the priority of this government. So, so in my view, uh, 
it's, it's, it's a communication problem, really. And I'll explain why. Now, the, the, the budget that we're speaking about is the supplementary budget. And uh, these issues of the yacht and stuff like that are something that I understand have been in the process from the Navy. It's, it, it's something, it, it's part of what is part of the Navy fleet. You know, uh, I, I did a little bit of research uh, on that myself when I saw it. And I'm not sure that uh, uh, the, the, the president himself is going to be, uh, is aware of some of the details. So, so some of these things, these things are communication problems. So for instance, you know, when that information goes out, somebody should have explained that, well, we're not just purchasing this yacht, you know, for luxury. This is something that is part of what, we, what, what our naval fleet does. Now, but the, to the point of the, of the, uh, the, the loans, I, I think that it is not an entirely bad thing to go get a loan, especially when you're dealing with a clear fiscal crisis. You know? Now, I believe, and I think the president himself, uh, through the Udile tax reform, just understand that we can still raise a lot of revenue in this country. You know, I mean, if, if you look at the, the, the ratio, we can do way better. But in the interim, you know, for a government that wants to do stuff, you can take the loans as long, as long as those loans are not being spent on the recurrent, on the, you know, uh, paying salaries and stuff. If it is going to be used for purposes of development, and many of them are actually uh, concessionary uh, rates. So it's not an entirely bad thing, but, but, but the point is that, this is the most important point, government cannot be uh, asking the people to tighten their belt, okay? Uh, and then you have all this kind of information going out and there are no explanations. You have a situation where even the legislators you know, are, are having to get uh, 160 million naira worth of SUV. So, so that's, that's why I say it, it comes down to, to, to communication and, and, know, and some, some sensibilities from, from our leaders. Some people said, government said people should tighten their belts while they are using suspenders so they can accommodate support. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Mr. let me ask you, um, Binder, do you, having been SSG uh, to a state, We've been asking questions as to this two billion for palliatives of the three billion that they will eventually get. Trying to find out how, what kind of impact will they ever have? Transparency. How are they utilizing these things? How can we ever be sure that no government will line their pocket or cronies with these monies at the end of the day? So. So from what you've seen so far, have you seen any transparency to instill confidence in the populace saying they will utilize this money judiciously as it has been given? Well, uh, I think your question is related to the palliative uh, policies being implemented as a result of the oil subsidy removal. Some say $5 billion and then $2 billion has been released to the governors. Actually, in real sense, checking the poverty level in our country and seeing the impact of the removal of the oil subsidy. Actually, two, five billion is nothing. If you do the arithmetic, it's not much at all. But it's better than nothing. And many governors have gone ahead to acquire food items and other bits and pieces as an immediate measure. They just literally brand the government as a caring government. You, 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 you now are transporting your vegetables from 50 naira, now it's 150 naira. Please uh, they calm down and take a bag of rice and then feel like the government cares, but some better things are going to come. So some governors have tried very well. We've seen the governor of Kasina working his heart out. We've seen the governor of Borno State. Uh, you know, there are many governors that are not visible in the media on what they're doing with the 205 billion. That's a uh, minus. Uh, well, I think so. I the think people, people don't know what you're doing. You're working in the dark. Know. Yes, people Absolutely. should see what you're doing. People Absolutely. should know what you're doing. And more so, you see, politics affects everything. Uh, the, you can see the partisanness about on how we do things. You, you, you're just talking about somebody has been appointed as an aide to aide. This is politics, you know. The same thing goes to the palliative. This local government voted for us. So we need to concentrate palliative to this other day. So it can do that. It's not like flat out. So, uh, but certainly connecting to the public through the media, through data and so on and so forth, 
can caution or reduce these, these uh, uh, anomalies. Ayo. I ask uh, you, um, uh, Mr. Conde, uh, while uh, Engineer Binri was talking about talking the other time, he mentioned, uh, he cited an example of a ministry and a department or agency of that ministry, uh, case in point in particular, he was talking about the Ministry of Health. Uh, from where you stand or from your experience, talk to us about the difficulties of collaboration. Well, the president was ad addressing ministers primarily, and he said anyone who doesn't uh, perform will be shown the door. I'm not sure it's going to be that easy to remove a permanent secretary or a civil servant, but ministers perhaps with that same fiat. Talk to us about the difficulties that the ministers or the president himself might have in the area of collaboration, without which there will be no hope in the renewed hope. Very good question, Ayo, because uh, if you look at the president's speech, he highlighted two important areas, and I think he must be commended uh, for that, where the impact uh, has to be seen. He highlighted health, you know, and he highlighted education. Now, the interesting thing to your question is that those are areas where not only will there be need for an effective collaboration uh, within the federal government agencies that deals with health and education, these are human capital development issues, but more so, and I hope the, the president and his team understands this, I, I believe they do, you got to work with the state governors for health, for education, these are concurrent issues. It's actually in the states that the impacts will be felt. So, so it, 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 it's, it's such a big deal uh, for, the, for, 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 for the team, for the federal government uh, and the president and his, and, and his ministers to understand that these are issues. The president elected education and health. These are issues that the federal government alone cannot deliver. There is no way the federal government alone can deliver on education. There is no way the federal government alone can deliver on health. So you have to carry the governors uh, along. You have to carry their own team. There must be a plan that, uh, that emphasizes the need that, that, that we have for effective collaboration mm. with the state. So, so you expect that this, the, 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 the president's speech ought to be taken to neck and see, so what, are the, uh, uh, what, what is the work plan? What is the plan of action okay. to ensure the, that to bring about the kind of collaboration well, that we deliver? on the areas of health and education. I, I, I'm glad that you are talking about the states, but I wish we had enough time to, to, to go there. But let me ask uh, Engineer Binder. I mean, you have worked with, with the Department of uh, Government before. You have been secretary to a state government. I'm looking for the difficulties, the, 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 the landmines, so to speak, that the ministers or anyone in office might fall into if the collaboration, uh, you know, does not happen? I mean, what are the things, what are the hindrances or inhibitions that they have to cross so that this collaboration can happen and then there can be delivery of service and governance? Thank you very much. A very, very important question. I, I hope part of the, I wished part of the presidential directive could have been that the delivery unit will also measure the level of collaboration, particularly between ministries and ministers. There is not one single point of the eight-point agenda that can be handled by one ministry. It's impossible. You put food security, they need science and technology to get the varieties and bit for farmers. If they need information to ensure that extension to farmers are, are there, they need Ministry of Transportation to make sure that the goods are transported. They need so many. So that the, the whole measurement should actually measure the interaction too. But as uh, the, the former advisor said, Partnership, not just within the system, you know, the ministers partnering with themselves and so on and so forth, sectorally. Partnership with the state governments is very, very important. I remember, yes, I was state, uh, the, the secretary to state government in Adama State. On basic education alone, the interaction between federal and the state government is through UBEC, which is a federal government institution. And the federal government has made available money to partner with the states to establish more schools, to buy more books, to train more teachers, and so on and so forth. But there should be counterpart funding from the state government for you actually to benefit. 
many state could, states could not even put the counterpart funding on the table. And therefore, federal government sits with their money, and then there is a, a lacuna. So wow. this, the measurement <clears throat> excuse me, of these things should all be factored into this delivery. Rate. Which state is not able to contribute? Why are they not contributing? Because still, people who voted for the president, children of parents that voted for this government, children of parents that are functional within government, are also, uh, uh, must also be beneficiaries. If the state government doesn't have money because they've had so much loans, and then the deduction at source, when they have their allocation, is draining their, 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 their resources, so the government has to come up with some kind of arrangement to ensure that the federal government, uh, the Ministry of Education, can now showcase their own uh, 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 delivery. Otherwise, I can tell you if this partnership is not also factored into the delivery system, um, some of the ministers will be totally dis Minister of Health is linked to the primary health care unit. Minister of Education is linked to the basic education. Minister of Information has got commas everywhere in this state, and so on and so forth. Everybody depends on what happens in this state. And in most cases, there's a collaboration in terms of resources, capacity, and capability to deliver. If the state is weak, the federal government also will feel that weakness. And I don't know how the minister can be marked when it is not his fault. Well, we'll mm. collaborate with the result delivery unit <laughs> so that uh, we'll begin to look at all those results. Since you say the media is supposed to be part of the members of the public who should see that document, so, yeah. which the president has said, look, form, we'll parlibate you, and then if not, we'll ask you, you to go perform somewhere else because, uh, I mean, they were good enough to become ministers. So clearly, they'll be good enough to perform in several other areas, perhaps their own field of expertise elsewhere other than the ministry, who knows. But I want to thank you both for coming on here today. Uh, Lalo Akonde, former presidential aide, as well as uh, Omar Brinder, an engineer, former national coordinator, national social investment program, and former secretary to Admiral State Government. Thank you for coming on today. Both thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay, so I think that wraps it up today with the program. We do thank you all for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain. Just looking at him like that because we're skipping meals again. But do we have it? We don't have it. We do. Lots of meals. This is from Paul Agbolati. What am I looking at then? I don't know what you I don't, are looking at. I think at. my result delivery unit is not uh, <laughs> coming up to task. I, I'm going to have to beat protocol because he's already, you know, said yeah, his name. We've got about five come on, come on, markets. Can I, I to go to the market. It has been, <laughs> you know what that means, don't you? Well, Paul Agbolati, I see you. Aburo Kenneth, we see you, and Dick Seneca, well, oh, we'll be taking them tomorrow. I will hold his sister to the fire, <laughs> I promise. Well, I'll hold the gavel. <laughs> Thank you for On watching today. I'm all well being used to. <laughs> and do have a productive day and make Nigeria yours. I'm Ayo Makinde. Have a good one.